Greetings, programs. This is Wretch. Welcome back to Vampire the Masquerade, Reckoning of New York. And in the last episode, guys, we saw the end of Kali's story. She was able to escape the city with a vial of the Ravnos antediluvian blood, but she paid a very high price for it. Not only did we see the death, or at least the parent demise, of her sire Reynard, which isn't that big of a loss considering the fact he tried to swerve her, we also saw the end of her friendship with Padrake, because Patty attempted to take the vial from her, and she, out of self-defense, staked Patty as the sun was rising. Now, we don't have confirmation that Patty is dead, and maybe we'll figure out what exactly happened to him in the next chapter, because Padrake is a playable character, and now we can see the story via his eyes. I'd never been this close to grasping the nature of my inner voices. The answer is almost within reach. Yet I can't help but question, when the stakes are at their highest, do I truly have what it takes to suffer the cost? Guess we're gonna find out. Play from chapter night one. Padraig relies on his caution and a mysterious liaison to avoid dangers and manage his hunger. Really? All right. Interesting. The dragon. Seven nights till the new year. Here we go again. The Brooklyn Bridge shimmering in the East River at night cast a hauntingly beautiful reflection. Despite witnessing countless global spectacles, there's an uncanny allure here. The flow of headlights, it reminds me of souls embarking on their eternal quest to Mog Mail. Hard to pinpoint why, really, although it might be about the company soon to join me. I wish I were able to immerse myself in this scene, truly appreciate it, but tonight's not the night. I see myself as a patient man, unbothered by impulses, scornful of fleeting whims. Hell, I actively fight against those very ideas every second of my own life, within reason, with reason as my guide, resolve as my sword, and my ring as my shield. And I'm accustomed to waiting here, on the deck of this opulent ship, where I'm expected to feel put in my place, to earn her precious time. Veritra, say what you might, those in the city wronged her by, by her certainly do not mince words, knows very well how to maneuver power dynamics under constant pressure. The lesser play is wait, while those in control choose when and where to make their appearance. And so, I wait. Normally it wouldn't bother me. I know what paltry regard she has for me. But I'm due elsewhere in half an hour, and this delay is making it impossible to be in Queens on time. The very idea of being late vexes me to the core. Not only because I detest tardiness and being reprimanded for it, but also because it's utterly unbecoming of my position among the upper echelons of New York City. My role as a mediator between the Anarchs and the Camarilla might be superficial, empty perhaps, but this position was thrust upon me, scornfully, I might add. It's better to play along and show them that their disdain is hardly enough to undermine my resolve. I'm shaken out of my reverie by the sound of soft, clacking footsteps on the deck. It seems she has deigned to grant me an audience. Greetings, Veritra. She doesn't respond at first, slowly sizing me up and clearly enjoying my unease. She's the only person whose presence I feel self-conscious about my perpetual slouch. Not that it matters. Even if I stood upright, she'd still towel over me, like the mythical demon from when she got a name. Forgive me for prying, but I'm already late for the council meeting. Is there a particular reason you've delayed me? Put me at risk of arousing their suspicions? Veritra's face remains cold and inscrutable except for the corner of her lips, stretching minutely to a half-smile. There is a reason behind everything I do, dear boy. As you know perfectly well, shouldn't a fashionably late arrival at Elysium diminish your perceived threat? No. It just makes me look like a... A despised scatterbrain could hardly pose any danger to the ivory tower, yes? Now tell me, is there anything you'd like to share regarding the council? I want to answer her. But suddenly, all I can hear are the echoing voices in my mind. Spill it. Tell her. Tell on them, lad. 
My hand instinctively seeks out my dice ring and spins it violently. You're nothing to them. Yeah, fuck them, boy. Fuck all of them. It lands on the 20 and the clam in my head stops. Thank God. I straighten my back just a little. Spying on the council for you is not part of our agreement. I'm not one of your pawns in this game. Surely you can get all the information you need elsewhere. She just smirks and stares at me unblinkingly with her unnerving, unmoving eyes as I try to be stern, but I'm not delusional. I know she could easily force anything she wanted out of me, but she probably won't. First, she wouldn't want to break her toy. Something, especially one with so much potential. Second, since I've revealed nothing so far, she clearly must have another source of intel. But I have no idea where, despite my short, private investigation on the matter. We stand in a prolonged, tense silence, with Veritra simply watching. Has the voice manifested again recently? I nod. Just nod. Tell me. It's a command, not a request. Thankfully, it's one I'm glad to follow. Uh, forgive me, but it was all rather convoluted. I caught fragments about the price of pursuit, the asking, and the shadow of the day star, but I don't know what any of that means. She nods to herself, her eyes still locked with mine until I can't help but avert my gaze under the immense pressure. Then surprisingly, for the first time tonight, it is she who turns away, looking thoughtfully to the horizon. And I can feel that rare impatience in me grow and fester like a wound. What is the purpose of our meetings if you keep your insights to yourself? Nobody's more surprised at this sudden outburst than myself, but the frustration forces me to move forward, even in spite of the Ritra's slowly rising eyebrows. I have to understand the nature of the voice. I need to know why it speaks to me, and why it's different from all the others that I can control. When Veritcha faces me again, her eyebrows are relaxed, her lips slightly upturned. All in due time, dear boy. Her grin widens, sending shivers down my spine. In several nights' time, I will gain knowledge beyond your imagination. An insight into the very fabric of our dark world. An associate of mine is nearing the end of his task. A task that heralds a new dawn. The end of your quest is nigh. But to that end, I have to offer you a new bargain. I will share my knowledge with you, but only if you agree to accept it. I do not remember the sensation of my mouth drying up in excitement, but I assume it resembles closely what I'm experiencing now. I am... I... Rain it in. I have to be careful. It's almost as if I'm Fion, on the verge of consuming the salmon of knowledge, blind to the potential fallout. And yet... What are your terms? Worry not. I won't make you go against your beliefs. I just need you to keep the council engrossed in the matters of least importance. I allow myself to feel a small bout of relief and smile a little. That shouldn't prove difficult. The council's already consumed by infighting instead of solving actual problems. Veritra smirks dangerously, showing rows of sharpened teeth. That may well change soon. Very soon indeed. Make sure to steer them away from anything that might hinder my cause. This time, when she turns away with a gentle swish of pull, it's clear that the audience is over. I nod at her and take my leave. Or am I taken to my leave, rather, and escorted back to the same R.I.B. that brought me back here nearly an hour ago? As we make our way towards the shore, I stare at the ship a little while longer, marveling despite myself. It's a perfect blend of low-key and lavish. Always on the move. An impenetrable, inaccessible river fortress. It's no surprise for Richard chose this vessel as a base of operations. The fact that she never leaves its deck shrouds both the ship and the Hudson Dragoness herself in even more mystique. 
This deliberate aura of mystery has sparked considerable speculation about her nature over the last year and a half. Even though I've been meeting with her regularly for months, she remains largely an enigma to me. Aside from the fact that she must be one of, if not the most formidable kindred on the East Coast. One might think that only fools would deal with the devil, and normally I would concur. But if Eritra holds the key to my answers I've been chasing for the better part of a century? The day star cometh, Fionn. Then I am prepared to walk Fionn's path, regardless of the cost. Rebuke, rebuke, er, rebuke at the Elysium. I shall be late for a crucial meeting at Elysium, all because of Eritra's ostentatious power play. The Council's growing mistrust of me will surely deepen further. Now, I'm not going to be able to uh, mimic the, what they say exactly from Kali's chapter, but I hope you all get the point. We'll see what happens here. The usually manageable traffic decides to betray me tonight, tagging on an extra 30 minutes to my journey and pushing my fashionably late arrival into plainly rude territory. In moments like this, I cannot shake the feeling that Veritra is manipulating me. Her fingers firmly wrapped around my throat, bending my destiny to her whims as one does a tender young branch. Struggling to put that thought aside, I arrive at the art hole in a sour mood. The council has the eerie ability to detect even the slightest hint of stress, which they'll exploit with all the subtlety of a ravenous bear mangling its prey. To further compound my irritation, one of Kadir's minions, my usual nemesis, guards the entrance to Elysium with his silent partner by his side. Caitiff, what a surprise. My buddy and I were placing bets on how late you roll up. Man, if I knew you couldn't care less, I'd have doubled that bet easy. Somehow, every word he utters manages to get on my nerves, no matter the topic. I pay them no mind and make my way to the entrance when suddenly, a firm hand on my chest stops me cold. You enter on my say-so, trash. Apologize like the good boy you are. Let me through. Ain't no way we're letting you just stroll in there. You gotta show some culture. You could not spell culture if the lettuce came up with handles. It's amazing you don't tip over from the sheer weight of ignorance you're lugging around. Now kindly clear the path, oh great paragon of culture, or I'll clear it through you. He steps back with a vacant- oops. He steps back with a vacant retraction of his hand and a dumbfounded look. I tip an imaginary hat his way. The slight improves my mood. But the swift, soundless sway of the door to Elysium extinguishes the last flicker of my spirits. I've never harbored an affinity for modern art. It seems too loud, too chaotic, and not an excessively abstract for my taste. Perhaps I'm old-fashioned, or perhaps I'm simply too old. However, I've learned to appreciate the frequent exhibits at the art hall, mostly out of necessity. My participation in discussions among the council members is minimal, so perhaps it was sheer boredom that eased my aversions, if ever so slightly. For instance, now would be an ideal moment to immerse myself in the extensive collection of street art on display. The latest, and for the moment, last exhibit before the gallery is temporarily closed under the pretense of renovation. For the past month, the space has undergone a significant transformation. The cavernous gallery, which used to echo with odd gasps inspired by the art, is now cluttered with equipment. The art hole has been converted into a makeshift command center by the order of Kadia, the local sheriff. And since a deafening silence befell the room the moment I stepped inside, there's nothing left for me but to look around and wait for the impending rebuke. I'd much rather study the art pieces than endure the stern gazes of the council members, each laden with barely concealed disdain. You must be setting some kind of record, Mediator. An hour and a half late. Gidea scoffs at me. His respect was never mine to claim, and judging by his unyielding expression, that door is now firmly shut. Take it on the chin. Please accept my sincerest apologies, esteemed members of the council. I assure you, this will not happen again. Our dear guest, your friend the Baron of the Bronx has already made amends on your behalf. Quite persistently, I might add. Almost if he foresaw this mediation role falling to himself. 
I shoot a glance at Torque. He can play it cool, but knowing him, he's fuming inside. Your appearance has already thrown us off course. Assume your position, and let's proceed without further interruption. Unless you feel the need to mediate that proposition. I nod, silently feigning remorse. Though there's little need to pretend, I genuinely detest being late. As I was saying, another group of Duskborn was destroyed last night, including a few Chantry-recognized alchemists. The onslaught has only escalated since Larson's final death two weeks ago. Oh, please, Aisling. Larson was not but a laughingstock. I take a seat next to Torque. Oh, sorry. I gotta get remember to get uh, Patty's voice whenever I do the narration. I'm sorry. I take a seat next to Torque, and he immediately leans closer, lowering his voice to a whisper that rumbles like distant thunder. What in the actual fuck, Padraig? You took forever. No one here knows about my little trips over the Hudson. Not even Torque. It's likely that not even Veritra's closest allies are aware of my involvement with her. That's why I always keep a handy excuse up my sleeve, one that's increasingly easy to concoct these days, though I wish it weren't necessary. Well, I encountered the troublemakers again. I had to clean myself up before coming here. Damn. How many? Just a couple of unprepared fanatics. It's hardly an epic tale. I'm just a bit vexed that they held me up. And you didn't think to mention it sooner? If anything can get a deer off your back, it's that. Come on, Torque. Do you really believe he would buy that? Tork gives me a look of mute understanding before he casts a sidelong glance at Kadir. Given the sheriff's interest in the hunter threat, I suspect he would question me about it rigorously, and I cannot risk losing grip on my tall tales. Look, I get that these nights are hard, but you've got to step it up, Patrick. You make me look bad in front of the council, and our truce is already hanging by a thread. Oh, fuck that mutt. Who the hell does he think he is? I know. Eh, I'm sorry about that. I listen in on the usual bickering at these meetings, but soon enough my mind begins to drift. We will be on the administrative stuff, for which I am thankful. That's when I'm usually the least welcome and often pointedly asked to step outside the walls of Elysium. Still, I've drawn some conclusions about the current power struggle within the local Camarilla. In short, Addison Payne is making a play for Prince Panhard's position as her indecisiveness in the face of the current threats keeps undermining her influence. But well, that's just the tip of the iceberg, noticeably even from as far away as my provenance requires me to stand. The root of her problem seems to be the continued fallout from Douglas Callahan's final death. From what I can tell, the former Anarch Baron, with whom she had a blood bond, was too deep in a risky game and got burned badly. The attempt to cover it up as a suicide would have succeeded if it hadn't been for Julia Sawinski throwing a wrench in the works. She exposed the scheme, revealing Carl Van der Weyden, the former Malkavian primogen, as the mastermind behind the murder. Somehow it never sat right with me. Knowing the court members better now, I'm fairly certain Van der Weyden was framed, although specifically why and by whom remains a mystery. Still, Julia's ascension to La Sombra primogen appears too swift to be merely a chance. Torque has told me only so much, but I chose not to dig deeper, letting bygones be bygones. I get the feeling it's a sensitive subject for him, not for any moral compunction, of course, but because he was somewhat involved in Callahan's demise. That naturally brings me to the conclusion that either he would had something on Panhard, or vice versa. Otherwise, his presence here wouldn't be as accepted, or should I say, tolerated, and maintaining the shaky truce between the Camarilla and Anox would be even tougher these nights. Yet, as Panhard's support continues to erode, strikingly so in the case of Arturo, the man otherwise known only for his long-standing influence on the Prince, Torque's sway is in rapid decline. And then, about six months ago, the Hunter anomaly appeared completely out of the blue, setting off a downward spiral. I snap out of these musings, only to discover that the topic at hand is entirely related to my thoughts. It's the usual interplay between the two factions. Gideon pushes for aggressive action against the Hunters, while Panhard, belittling the Sheriff's confrontational stance, advocates for dialogue with Veritra, a tactic that is yet to produce any favorable outcomes. The stalemate seems to be stretching on and on. I lean in closer and whisper to Torque. How long has this been going on? Maybe two hours? Honestly, I can't even tell anymore. 
It's endless and fruitless as usual. Suddenly, the bickering halts abruptly, like a knife slicing through the tension in the room. For a brief moment, I worried that I had just made my second and likely final mistake of the evening. Fortunately, the glances are directed elsewhere and not at me. I wait, hoping someone will break the uneasy silence. What exactly are you implying, Sheriff? What kind of new lead are we talking about here? Last night, with Valerie's assistance, we ruled out the possibility that the SAD or any other federal agencies tied to the Second Inquisition are behind this aggression. Regrettably, whoever's orchestrating their operations remains a mystery. I must say, this hardly qualifies as a lead. It's more of a monumental setback. Perhaps. However, there's been another development. We suspect that a party from outside New York is involved in the arms trade, directly supplying the hunters with equipment. This party is a member of the Ravnos clan. A ripple of unease spreads through the room. How very fortuitous for you, Kadir, to uncover such vital information at such an opportune moment. There was some fortune in how we came upon this intelligence, I admit. Specifically, we accidentally intercepted a shipment filled with firearms. The shipment had almost no traceable marks. The driver, a ghoul, only knew that the intermediate stops and provided no clues about the final recipient. Sounds like onion routing to me, honestly. Perhaps, but we managed to loosen the driver's tongue enough to force a name out of him. Raynard Castle. Wana vas, wana vas. I pay close attention as the room falls silent. The sheriff milks the silence masterfully, like a seasoned thespian. Even I have to admit, that is impressive. Our research on Castle suggests he's somewhat obscure con artist and part-time blood dealer who specializes in acquiring specific blood resonances. His name has surfaced in a couple of reports over recent years, yet until now his scheme seemed irrelevant to our operations. If this Castle has indeed been trading blood beyond our oversight, the circulatory system would certainly be aware of it. Well, I've got multiple confirmations on that story from different sources. And really, I think ignoring a potential clue just because your drone screwed up their records pain is pretty damn foolish. Considering the scanned information available on Castle, based on what we know now, I'd say he's quite adept at staying off the grid. The name doesn't ring a bell. I wonder if Mado knows something about this Ravnos crook. But even if he does, he probably wouldn't talk about it, haunting past and all. In any case, one thing is certain. There's a kindred actively stoking the fires of war, supplying our enemies with military-grade equipment. The evidence we've compiled on Castle might be circumstantial, but when you take a step back, it does add up. I'm convinced that Castle is the key to exposing the brains behind the Hunter movement. It sounds too good to be true, yet despite my reservations about Kadir, he's usually on point. Forgive me, Kadir, but it all sounds like wishful thinking. How does a nobody from nowhere suddenly rise to warlord status just like that? Most crucially, why hasn't he been apprehended yet? We've been on his trail for a couple of nights now, but he continues to elude us. As for his motives, we may be close to uncovering them. Stop with the mystery, Sheriff, and give us something substantial. The way Kadir... The way Kadir levels Arturo with a look. I'd rather not find myself on the receiving end of his gaze. We've learned that Castle's child recently surfaced in New York. Valerie was tasked with delivering her to the council. She should be escorted her, escorting her to Elysium as we speak. You chose not to disclose this because... Arturo unceremoniously interrupts the prince. I squint at him with surprise. With his sophisticated manners, such uncouth behavior is highly irregular. What true insight could the child of a trickster possibly offer? Dishonesty is their clan's trade. It's doubtful she knows anything of Castle's schemes, and if she does, she's likely to feed us with lies. That's a remarkably astute observation from you, Arturo. I'm genuinely surprised. However, that's not the reason I'm bringing her in. My plan is to squeeze her until she spills her guts or her cries lure Castle out from wherever he's hiding. 
a commotion rises, and Panhard gets onto her feet. Have you finished waving your fantasies, Kadir? Weaving them? Because I can't entertain these delusions any longer. We've already lost too much time on this while the true crisis goes unaddressed. It isn't me who is delusional, Prince. Or should I remind you of your own lapses in judgment? The bickering erupts once more. I tune it out and lean closer to the torque. Castle? Do you know anything about this castle figure? Bits and pieces. I know at least one of ours has brought blood off of him. I wouldn't call that Raven a major player if he was drawing blood from Cain himself. But that's not the real issue here. What Kadir is suggesting. Cain, mythical figure considered to be the first and most powerful vampire, the same person as Cain from the biblical stories. Some vampires refer to themselves as Cainites, members of the race of Cain. It's a move that might just help clear out the bastards who've been escalating their attacks on our turf. It's not just blindly flat charging into the night looking for clashes the way Kadir loves to do. The front door opens with a sudden yet graceful swing. It's Valerie, with another kindred in tow. Must be none other than Castle's child. The girl's a peculiar sight. Petite, dressed in what I can only describe as questionably fashionable rags, she scans the room with her eyes of someone calculating her quickest exit. Understandable, given the circumstances. I glance at the council members, but they're too wrapped up in their fervent argument to notice the newcomers. Valley doesn't seem Inga to interrupt either. Wouldn't have been such an issue if we had taken obvious action when the signs were so glaringly obvious. If only the rest of us were blessed with your profound gift of foresight, Sheriff, on life would be a walk in the park. Allow me to emphasize, our risks aren't limited to a single front. Acting on a gut feeling might work wonders in motion pictures, but here, in the real world, it's a different story. Spare me the pretense of ignorance, Arturo. The pattern was unmistakable well over a month ago. Now... Little bitch. Bad news is what she is. Liar, liar, liar. On a closer look, Castle's child looks wholly innocuous. Hardly the type you'd associate with any kind of hostile activity. But something about it unsettles me. A feeling I can't quite put into words. My ring is spinning before I even acknowledge the need to do so. Your playful decision to allow the Thin Bloods to appoint Larsons as their primogen raises his final death to a level that can be, can be casually swept under the rug, Helene. Thin Blooded or not, it throws into question our grip on the situation. What would you have me do then? Unleash our dear Sheriff without adequate reconnaissance, just in the name of haste? We can't overlook his excessive efficiency in the last skirmish, can we? Doesn't the prospect of a masquerade breach give you pause? I sense Tork shifting next to me, his arm brushing mine. He's visibly agitated, the ongoing argument clearly getting under his skin. I figure we're all fond of keeping things the way they are. But there's times to just sit back and think, and then there's times when you gotta step up and do something bold. This? This feels like it's time to make a move. An anarch championing chaos, a revelation that somehow fails to astonish, oh esteemed Baron of the Bronx. I steal another glance at the girl. There's a look in her eyes that suggests she knows that she's in a tight spot, but does she understand the full extent of the game being played around her? And how little importance the players attach to pawns like her? If deception is indeed a hallmark of a clan, she might. Nevertheless, I can't help but feel a twinge of pity for her, whereas I am of the daunting pressure the council can exert. The asking is yours, Fionn. Better to rip the band-aid off. We'll all be here all night if I don't steer their focus her way. My apologies for interrupting, Mr. Payne, but it appears Mr. Vall has brought forth the issue you mentioned earlier. It might, not, it might be wise to ensure she is not exposed to unnecessary information. Yes, thank you for that shrewd observation, Caitiff. She hurls those words at me like a snake spitting venom. I wonder, would her attitude change if she knew I wasn't truly a Caitiff? Esteemed Council, I give you the troublesome Ravnos Neonate. 
I gather you all desire swift resolution to this matter. Her disruptions have been minimal thus far. Let us hope that trend continues. Finally, their eyes shift to the mat at hand. I understand the formal necessity of addressing all this, as well as my role in the matter. However, there are more pressing concerns demanding attention. Far more pressing. Well, shall we discard all traditions too while we're at it? You have pirouetted all around the Hudson problem for more than a year, yet progress remains as stale as our debate. Certainly, a few additional moments to honor the very laws you spearhead so vigorously couldn't hurt, could they? The Hudson is a completely different beast, as you're well aware. We need to address the Locust Swarm engulfing New York before the Camarilla's entire framework crumbles beneath its weight. And how does that sit with you, Payne? Just last night, two Duskborn and a fledgling from your clan were reduced to ashes, and we're still in the dark about who's pulling the strings. Shouldn't that worry you more than policing the purity of the Red Market? In principle, I agree, Sheriff. However, should we continue to disregard even minor infractions, we broadcast a message of vulnerability. Vulnerability threatens our efforts within and beyond our borders. Efforts we plan to carry on without interruption once the Locust Squarm, as you termed it, is eradicated. I can't believe I'm saying it, but I'm inclined to agree with Gramps on this one. We can't simply let something like that slip through the cracks without taking proper measures. So you've assumed the role of his advocate now. Quite the bold ascent up the ladder for your own, of your own making, Julia. What's next on the horizon? Another hostile... Enough. Enough already. Uneasy silence falls over the room. Everyone automatically slips into their accustomed roles. A month ago, I might have speculated that their reactions were purely theatrical, honed through the years of political maneuvering. But right now, I have little certainty. Perhaps they're generally unsettled. When the prince finally manages to speak, her voice lacks the confidence you'd anticipate from someone at the helm. I sense she's not just putting on an act. We're all here for the same reason you are, Aisling. Or I'm mistaken and you forget where your loyalties lie? Now, let's put this issue to rest here and now. Strive for brevity, Sheriff. Understood. Kali of Clan Ravnas, you stand accused of violating the New York Camarilla's praxis, infringing on the tradition of hospitality, and endangering the masquerade, among other things. Wait, on what grounds? Drop the act. There's a wealth of evidence in that recreational vehicle of yours, most of it confirming the suspicions we've been harboring over the recent months. Petty theft from our subjects, imperson impersonation of other kindred, lineage forgery, Need I go on? But your involvement in large-scale blood and mortal trafficking outside our scrutiny and the jurisdiction of the circulatory system is as obvious as it is dangerous to the stability of our domain. Especially with your clientele often being in direct hostility to our interest, as Primogen Payne was kind enough to confirm. While some might chalk this up to colossal stupidity, I am neither so forgiving nor tolerant of fraudsters who respect nothing but their own gain. I settled in, waiting for the drama to unfold. I'm genuinely curious about how this raving girl will handle the questioning. What intricate web of not lies, what complex multi-layered stories might she spin just to save herself from the council? This is not the time to be quiet, Raven. This is total crap. I don't even own that RV. I snagged it on a rental from this Anarch guy in the Bronx. Oh, you did, huh? What are the odds, right? See? Why, why don't you grill your barren friend over there? I wince at the blatant lie, shooting Tork a questioning glance, but he just rolls his yellow eyes with impatience. Well, there was an attempt, I suppose. I earnestly hope you're not taking me for a fool. That would be a mistake of monumental proportions, unlike anything these walls have witnessed. At the corner of my eye, I catch a glimpse of the Tremere region silently mouthing what appears to be, I beg to differ, and it would be hard to disagree. Suddenly, the air is thick with tension. I catch Tork's eye as he looks at me. 
Gadea has had enough of the girl's attempts to weave up falsehoods. A curved sword swiftly materializes in his hand, plucked out of thin air. I am not here for your games, little raven. Choose your next words carefully. I'd argue this utter lunacy clears her of charges. She couldn't even cobble together a feeble story, much less orchestrate clandestine trading of this magnitude. And yarn spinning is supposed to be your clan's forte, isn't it? Last chance, my dear. Is there anything of substance you wish to add? There's a certain toughness in her demeanor. I look at her intently. Her struggle is clear as the first snow of winter. I wonder if there's more to her than meets the eye. Gauge her intentions. Listen to the voices. Oh dear. Oh, I don't even know what her or what uh, Patty's powers are. Let's listen to the voices though. I quiet my thoughts in anticipation of the usual noise, but almost in defiance, the voices in my head stay silent. That rarely happens. How curious. Guess there's not much point in playing dumb, huh? couldn't agree more. All right, then. So, I am in... I indeed am tangled up in this little blood trafficking operation. Playing a pretty crucial part, if I do say so myself. Though I guess not everyone's on board with that assessment. I do the logistics. Pushing merchandise through a series of dark web channels. Every eye barrow in the room goes up. With the exception of Julia, whose lips curve into a slight smirk. All totally secure and anonymous. No slips about, you know? Our thing? Everything masked by the hustle of more mundane black markets. No way we're blowing the masquerade. We deal in stored blood, as you might have caught on. Not just any blood, though. Our merch is a little jazzed up. Thaumaturgically enhanced, to be exact. It's the only way they'd work, as you're well aware. Uh, right. Of course. Oh, and we also deal in, uh, let's just call them family treasures. But honestly, there's more like, that's more like a side gig than anything serious. But we're extremely careful about picking our clients and rarely thorough when it comes to making deals. You know, the traditions and all. I was sure we'd never even come close to breaking them. At least, that's what he led me to believe. The girl's voice drops, heavy with faux drama. I, I had a hunch there was some dodgy dealings in his more secret ventures. Deny that would be a flat-out lie, but let's be real. I'm way outside the inner circle to have a real sway in those parts of his enterprise. An uneasy silence sweeps over the room for a brief moment. Theatricality at its best. His enterprise. Is this a joke? Exactly who is this he you're referring to? I, I thought, I presumed you knew it was my sire who's masterminding it all. The room is soon filled with muted whispers after the shocking revelation. I refrain from joining the murmuring crowd just yet. Indeed, how fortuitous and your sire would be. There's only one other notable rogue in the city who comes to mind. Someone dipping in and out, known for their shifty nature of which I was somewhat aware. Raynard Castle. You nailed it, Chief. I mean, sir. Another brief moment of silence gets interrupted by Julia, who decides to throw her two cents into the fray. I can practically hear the cogs turning in your head, Kadir. What's your take on it? Truth be told, it does add up, though I had him pegged more as a con artist than a trafficker. Then why hasn't been apprehended yet, Sheriff? Are you secretly endorsing activities that impede the circulatory system's operations? For your own good, Payne, I'll pretend I didn't catch that. Or would you care to question my dedication to our cause again? Be warned, my patience wears extremely thin these nights. Can we put this bickering on hold, at least for the moment? Uh, one more thing. Raynard and I had a meeting lined up with a client a few hours back, but he never showed up. In the whole year and a half I've been in this gig, he's never just vanished like this. And what do you make of it? To be honest, 
I'm not sure, but now that I think of it, he's changed over the last past month, become a lot more erratic than usual. You ready for my theory? I'm pretty sure he caught wind of your lot and decided to feed me to the flames while he made a run for it. I can't quite explain it, but there's an authenticity in how she constructs her story. Not every single word, perhaps, but the overall intent feels genuine. Honest. Shut up. Liar, liar, pants on fire. I believe she truly doesn't know where Castle is, and it's tearing her apart. Let her burn. She'll burn you to a crisp like a piece of trash. Kadir's approach just doesn't sit right with me. Not the way he envisions it. She is the key. An unwitting pawn betrayed by her master. A likely story. Suitable for the stage indeed. But in this context, this will just not do it all. If I may. Damn it, Patrick, don't go getting yourself into... I ignore Torque, to my future detriment, most likely. In an instant, the top echelon of New York's kindred fixed their eyes on the mine with unmistakable hostility. Since you've already disrupted the proceedings, you might as well say your piece, mediator. Very well, then. I'm inclined to believe her, at least in the aspects more significant to the interests of our allies. As ever, your assertion remains devoid of substance. My guide's advice is pretty much always on point. His track record speaks for itself. I give Torque a grateful look, but he doesn't return it. I am definitely in for a tongue lashing later. That much is clear. The sheriff has a point that seems to hold water. Her sire might just be the one at fault. She's essentially a non-entity, is she not? A nobody that slipped under the radar until by a stroke of sheer bad luck, she got caught red-handed. Do excuse the pun. When you give it another look, the evidence you have collected should indeed back up that claim quite convincingly. And what grounds you intricate? Your intricate evaluation, precisely. What grounds that? My judgment is shaped by your vast experience and simply tempered by reasoning and intuition. It changes little regarding the consequences you must face for her complicity in her sire's crimes. How about I serve you Renard's, Reynard's head on a silver platter in exchange for mine, unscathed, on my shoulders? Gadea glares at the girl with a look that could kill. Something that happens far too often these nights, but at least he lets us speak. I know all his secret spots in this town, plus the spots he wouldn't touch with a ten-foot pole. I'm wired into his network, his contacts, I've got his playbook down, and I can stay one, head, one step ahead of him with ease. Just give me a chance, and we will all be thanking our lucky stars by the end. A quiet introspection befalls the room. It's apparent that opinions are split, yet gradually it seems the consensus is shifting in favor of the girl's proposal. I give myself an imaginary pat on the back. I have reservations about this daring proposition. Consider the potential fallout of this entire situation spirals out of control. Kadir throws up his hand, clearly having reached a decision. I cannot suppress a smirk at how I disrupted their plans with barely a flick of my wrist. Quite the mediator I am. Really. Capturing this well proved hardly a challenge. I wouldn't sweat the idea of catching her again. What's more, entrusting her with Castle Rip resolves two issues at once. It swiftly eliminates her presence and enables us to prioritize genuine concerns. But someone has to keep a constant watch over her. Valerie, perhaps one of yours... How about him? It takes me a moment to notice the Ravnos girl pointing directly at me and even longer to realize the implications. Stupid, stupid, stupid. My eyes quickly sweep over the council members, catching the faint smirks on their faces. This cannot... Surely you're not considering... This could play out quite favorably, I must admit. Quite favorably, indeed. Bollocks. Very well, Padre Conroy. I hereby appoint you as the agent caretaker for this Ravnos neonate. I had to break it to you, Sheriff, but this call is out of your turf. He's with us Anarchs, and you know it well enough. 
technically, when he took on the whole peacemaker role for our cliques, he acquired a level of neutrality, so yeah. None of that matters. I realize as soon as Kadia redirects his gaze to me. Your responsibility is to ensure she fulfills the assignments within four nights, starting now. Any slips up on her end will reflect on your record as well. Do we have an understanding? And not in resignation. Clearly the situation has moved beyond my control now. Stupid little Patty. You fucking moron. Four nights. Not long at all. Yet they stretch out like an eternity ahead of me. This arrangement might also hamper my visits to Veritra. Now, back to where we were. I suppose all I can do is grip my teeth and do my best to track Castle down. The sooner I get down to it, the faster I'll be able to return to my own agenda. And I doubt the girl will be much help. Unless, of course, that Ravnos trickster turns out to be a wild card. Whew. Alright guys, well we got to see that entire meeting from Patty's point of view. And get to see a little bit about the voices. Now, one of the things that I... I hated um, in retrospect was the fact that I gave Patty like the typical New Yorker accent when he was obviously from like the British Isles or Island so I went ahead and like his voices are more from where he came from maybe the accent is something he developed while he was here I don't know but we're gonna go ahead and go with that and uh, we'll continue with this and kind of see what's going on from the other side in the next episode hope you all have enjoyed it if you liked the episode, please leave a like down below, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, that'd be a big help, and we'll see you next time. Later days, everyone.